Okay, we're live, we're back. We're here in Life of the Law, which is our program with lawyers and things legal every Wednesday at 1 o'clock. And uh, we have Richard Turbin and his wife. Is that, that's not a secret or anything, right? No. Uh, Ray St. Chu. Um, and they are here together because they have been practicing together for all the all these years. You don't mind if I talk about how many years? Of course. Okay. okay yeah. Say hello to the people. Hey, hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> hello. <laughs> so you guys have you you have a lot of marriedness about you, and I wonder if you could uh, describe in general, um, you know, how you got started being married in the same firm. How did that happen? Well, we met at the public defender's office. Okay. We're all, um, we're all good relationships to begin, you know. Yes, <laughs> and uh, Rich had already been there for about a year and a half, and I arrived, and uh, he asked me to lunch, and so there it goes. You know the rest of the story. 1960. 1971. One. Right, and, and, you know, we got along so well that, you know, we just kept going, and then when um, he needed he had an attorney suddenly resign, and I, he asked me to come over and help him out, um, and I did. And I said, well, you know, I've got one kid on the way and another baby yeah, at the, home um, still, and uh, so I might as well just move in with you, and, <laughs> and you can handle, you know, you can pay for the rent much better than I can. <laughs> on my own, so um, so we combined forces at that time. So, um, of course, I didn't have a choice in the matter. But just to go back to our this is known as rebuttal. Yeah, right. This is our <laughs> this is my rebuttal. Uh, you know, it's amazing how two different people can see things. You know, different ways. You know, how many, uh, you know, how many as aspects of this elephant. But um, uh, poor Ray, because we met. I took her out to lunch like her second week in Hawaii. I, I'd already been living in Hawaii for two years, so the, the poor gal just didn't have a chance, you know. So she got stuck with me. But in any event, um, when we got married uh, in 1976, um, we were, we both had our own law practices. She had just started her solo law practice with another woman. It was a woman's law firm. And I had just started my well, there law practice. There weren't women practicing in those days. No, that was really saying that's something. true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. be among the first. Oh yeah, she, you know, there was Twelve big or news. Twelve fifteen, I would say. Yeah, yeah. but the what? Most. <laughs> but what happened? I must say, when she, when we had our second child, and I lost uh, one of my associates, and Ray just came. I asked Ray to help clean up the cases, and she came in and basically said, "Well, I'm moving in." It doesn't make sense for us to have to pay for two different law firms. Yeah. Much more efficient to have one law firm. But I have to say, when she moved in, that's when my law practice boomed. Really took off. So I, I mean, it's just coincidence. No, it's not coincidence. I mean, it just. <laughs> uh, sh I mean, it was. We became so much stronger as partners together than we were. Uh, separate. So what kind it of really law practice worked. Uh, was it? Is it? Well, at that time, I had been, you know, I had I had a general law practice, but I was beginning to to specialize uh, plaintiff's personal injury law and medical malpractice law. And uh, Ray, when Ray came in, uh, she was doing family law primarily, but she was managing the law firm, and really started um, PR, much better management. You know, we got into uh, dignified advertising, and uh, it was just it starting then, wasn't it? Well, he yeah. was the first to have a picture in the yellow pages. <laughs> of course, now we don't use yellow pages at all, or advertising yellow pages at it all. It was an issue. It was an issue, and you, yeah. you had to go very slowly at that point in time. Yeah. But you know, Ray was just so Akamai. I mean, really, much smarter with practical. Uh, issues than than I am, and especially a perfect then. match, I'd say. Good yes. match. <laughs> I think that's probably true all the way through. He's the you know very theoretical, but you know, but very strategic as well. And I'm I'm more the pull back. Let's think about this. Let's perfect. you know go to step by step, logically and analytically, rather than just jumping in 
on yeah. all fours. The other thing, you know, Ray did for me was she got me involved in bar politics. I was never interested in that. She was, but before she came into the law practice, and then I got involved with the American Bar Association and became chair of the tort and insurance section. Then I became. Uh, got this was in the seventies. Yes, yeah, well, eighties. This was kind of now we're now we're into the eighties, and then uh, I got involved in Hawaii State Bar Association, became president in two thousand and five, and then she became president in two thousand and nine. So that was another way that we had uh, really good synergy working together to hopefully uh, better the profession or I contribute to the profession. And my reaction at the time was uh, she saw how much fun you had, so she wanted to do the same thing. Was that the way it worked? Oh, no. Well, I <laughs> always wanted to do it, to tell you the truth. Okay. But, you know, being from a small firm, I didn't have the network of, you know, supporters and partners mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that could, you know, help me get elected. And so I just kind of stood back and and uh, they asked Rich to run because he had been involved in the American Bar Association uh, and, and of course, did a very good job and it's distinguished himself. It's a nice, it's a nice himself. evolution from one to the other. Yeah. Right. So yeah. then they asked him to run, and I said, oh, great, go ahead, go for it. Um, and in the back of my mind, I said, you know, I've been involved with, with the bar since uh, I was a young lawyer, which meant that... Uh, you know, the first year after I got admitted to practice, I became a board member of the Young Lawyers, mm -hmm. and then I served as a board of the, you know, senior, not senior lawyers, but the, the HSBA, which is the overall uh, organization. And, um, you know, and I'd always thought, well, gee, you know, I would like to run, but then, of course, after he had served, you know, there was a lot more visibility for both of us, and so I thought, well, it's a good time for me to jump in. So, so I did. That's great. And right. I loved it because it's it's no better service to the legal profession right. than to lead it and to you know push through a few initiatives. And but uh, here's a nice uh, little anecdote about Ray getting me involved. What happened with my uh, leadership in the American Bar Association is, you know, two guys who were leaders in the American Bar Association called me up. They were planning a meeting in Hawaii, asked if I would help out, and I said, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not interested. And then uh, the, uh, the, the uh, bar convention, the annual meeting was in San Francisco, so a few weeks before that meeting, uh, Ray said, come on, Rich, uh, we're going to go to that meeting in San Francisco, and you're going to meet those guys who wanted you to get involved. So that's how. So okay, we'll go, and that's so. Two kids and a nanny, so two, we all <laughs> went. <laughs> yeah, so that's how we got involved. Uh, that's how I got involved. Well, you guys, you know, did you know in law school or when you first started practice that you'd be so active in the community? Or was this something that you, you know, decided earlier or later? I think. Um, I mean, I was always. You went to Harvard, right? Right, yeah, they Harvard. Have a course in, in this subject? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I don't. Of course, everybody who goes to Harvard Law School is expected to become a senator or a president <laughs> or, or something like that. You know, that, you know I certainly did not. Uh, um, I did, in fact, but I, but I must uh, brag, I did get um, invited to be a distinguished alumni of Harvard Law School. And when I asked the, the dean, why me? He says, Richard, uh, you're the only plaintiff's personal injury lawyer graduate from Harvard Law School that I could find. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's nice. And we needed, see, we needed a, plaintiff's, uh, a plaintiff's lawyer to be a distinguished alumni. Um, but no, I, I think we're just both of us, uh, you know, very uh, community-minded. Um, you know, there's this um, uh, thing, this notion about giving back. Uh, you know, Hawaii has been, you know, very good to us. Uh, we've had a great life here. We've been successful. We've raised our family here. And I think both Ray and I feel that it's uh, important to give back. And so if we can give back by uh, uh, my service uh, in the neighborhood board or in the bar. I want to talk about that. Yeah, and but Ray, first, I want to offer yeah. Ray an opportunity to rebut everything you've said. <laughs> uh, that'll be easy. No, no. Did uh, you have a class at what law school did you go to? University of Maryland. Okay. But You're when an East I Coast was girl. yeah, when I was in the undergraduate 
uh, school, University of Maryland. I did run for, um, they called it SGA, Student Government Association, um, officer like uh, my junior year and my senior year. And so I remember the going from dorm room to dorm room, you know, passing out my flyers and, you know. It was those early days. <laughs> early <laughs> days, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, but I had a lot of fun and met a lot of people and uh, got me out of my comfort zone, really. And um, I thought it was a very positive experience, so I always had that in me. And so actually when I came to Hawaii, um, I wanted to, you know, get involved in politics. And then in 1978, they were uh, seeking candidates to run for the Constitutional, Constitutional Convention. Convention. And uh, I said, what the hell, I'm going to run. And, but I, you know, I organized everything. And I went out on the street about six weeks before the election. And, um, and I won out of you know, 26 candidates or so, some very prominent, that was really important. prominent people. Did you know then how important that was going to be, how historic that was going to be? No, I didn't realize it. I mean, but they did have uh, the 68 Constitutional Convention when Hawaii was a very new state. So um, that it was definitely necessary at that time. And I think they needed some more work on the Constitutional. Polish, polish it, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so very fortunately, um, OHA was formed, Judicial Selection Commission was formed by the convention and uh, some constitution, I mean, some uh, environmental uh, standards and um, uh, a nuclear ban uh, for the state and many others, which I thought was uh, a lot of free speech issues, although nobody, uh, but the issue of uh, recall and referendum was very difficult. A lot of people wanted it, but in retrospect, I'm glad we don't have it because. While, while we're on the subject, uh, you know, we haven't had one since. Um, do you think we should have had one since? Do you think we should be having one now? Well, the the strange thing was uh, at the time in 1978, it was the the people who um, were in power that wanted to have it, you know, like the unions and blah blah blah, uh, and and then. The last time, I think it was a lot of the Republicans who did not, who were out of power, who didn't feel that they could get a fair shake getting certain things done in the legislature uh, because they were the minority. They were the ones that were pushing it. In more recent years. More recent years. Yeah. And then also before they were against it because they didn't want to spend the money to convene the convention and pay everybody. But anyway, so. But more recent years, they wanted That's to have one. It's interesting the yeah. way that works, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. If you're in power, you're happy with the status quo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you took a page out of Ray's book, didn't you? She activated you in terms of running for office. Um, well, you know, I'm. Well, I'm not so. Sh I mean, I, yes, she was very encouraging. Uh, and I, uh, you know, did run for office for the city council. Well, let's let's go to the neighborhood board first. Right. You right. were a perennial at the neighborhood board. You were right. the, the largest political figure, you know, west of Kaimuki, <laughs> east of Kaimuki. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I ran for the uh, Wailakahala neighborhood board, and I was chair for 15 years, and I'm still on it. Uh, I really enjoy it. 15 years? 15 years I was oh chair. Goodness. And uh, you want to get a special award for that alone. I know. Yeah. Total I know. how long on the board? <laughs> well, now it's, it's like, years. you know, now it's over 35 years. On the neighborhood board. Yeah, on the neighborhood board. I mean, I, I was chair for 15 years, and my goal was to accomplish, you know, two or three goals a year. Uh, you know, improve a park, get a park fixed up, get, you know, get water, get water fountain on the beach. Uh, fight and defeat uh, a gnarly uh, development proposal, you know, of which there are many. And then, of course, um, you know, the last major goal was to somehow uh, rid our, our environment of, uh, 
you know, of a nasty uh, individual who was buying and tearing down houses. Whose name will go unmentioned. Yeah, again, name will go unmentioned, although I think we all know who we it is. We all know who we are talking about, yeah. And uh, I worked very long and hard on that. And, uh, you know, it's funny, you never know who the angels are going to be. And in this, this case, the angels were the Japanese IRS and A and B, you know. So who knew? <laughs> yeah, who knew? Of course, I was working with the city and trying to get the city to take action, but uh, they largely did not. Well, you know, it goes to show, I mean, I don't think there's anybody who has made the kind of contributions to the neighborhood board and thus the neighborhood board systems, as you, Rich. And um, it, it goes to show that the neighborhood board can do things. Right. A lot of people complain that, you know, it's just for trim only uh, decoration and it does no power and all this. But it, it, if you play it right, the neighborhood board can do a lot. Right. Yeah, the neighborhood boards have a lot more power than people think. And who else, you know, is so close to the community, you know, but the neighborhood board. So, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll throw in a little ad for the neighborhood board, please. You know, uh, uh, take the time, you know, run for a neighborhood board position. You know, go to meetings. There's, there's only, it's only once a month. So, you know, it's hardly a real imposition on your time. Uh, I was able to, you know, uh, be a successful chair, probably not spending more than, um, five hours a week on it you know uh, if you use your time efficiently you can get a tremendous amount done and uh, you're a forum with the with the government with the state government and the county government so, it's a way to run for office it's, yeah. it's a it's a ramp to run for office right, which we should right. talk about after the break by the way you you can't be successful on the neighborhood board unless you're a reasonably nice nice person I gotta add that <laughs> <laughs> that's Richard Turbin and Ray St. Chu his wife Life in the Law, um, let's see, Partners in Law, Partners in Life is the name of our show. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back for more about Richard and Ray. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia, and by Asia we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world, uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Hi, my name is Seymour Kazimersky. I have a show called Seymour's World on Think Tech Hawaii. Our show is about opening minds and facilitating conversation. To tell you the truth, I have no idea what we're going to be talking about. I have no idea who our guests are going to be, but I guarantee you we're going to have lots and lots of fun. Aloha from Seymour's World. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. Life in the law. Um, partners in Law, Partners in Life, Richard Turbin and Ray St. Chu. So, um, you know, one of the things that I really enjoy most about these Think Tech talks are the breaks. Because at the breaks, things will sort of tumble out that you, you didn't cover yet. And, and then you can go back and you can remember. And so I would like, if you don't mind, Ray, if you could talk about what we discussed in the break about, about Carol Monley. Oh, Sharon yes. Broder. No, I was talking about Constitutional Convention, and Carol Monley and Sherry Broder were the staff attorneys there. You know, we've been friends ever before that and ever since. Yeah. But mostly we met through uh, Hawaii Women Lawyers because I started the organization, and Carol came along maybe a year, a second year. Um, I was putting together a lunch. For the uh, with the women legislators and uh, women lawyers in Hawaii, and Carol called up at the last minute and said, "Oh, can I come?" I said, "Of course, of course, I'll count you, count you in." And uh, she says, "Well, I'd be happy to help you anytime you want, want me to." And you know, blah. So then the rest, the rest, history. you know, is history. And, and Carol is now vice president. I guess that was a sort of a, an important ramp up there too, because that that led ultimately to. <laughs> Carol becoming the vice president and uh, COO, chief operating officer at ThinkTech right now, and a director. Uh, anyway, so um, I also wanted to talk about what it is to practice in this area. 
you know, not only do you have to be a nice person to, to be on the neighborhood board, you have to really have great people skills, but to be a guy who loves jury trials and a girl, who loves jury trials, who likes to get out there and relate to a jury, that's a special experience with, with a fraction of a small percentage of people can actually do that well. So what is it like to, you know, to run your practice around convincing juries and, and making personal injury plaintiffs work, make it, making it work? Uh, well, thank you, Jay, for that question. Uh, it really is, um, you know, a wonderful profession. Uh, we're very lucky uh, being, being lawyers, and I just love being a trial lawyer. I mean, I don't think I could be any other kind of lawyer. I can't do that kind of paperwork and that, uh, you know, really sitting at the desk, uh, you know, hour, hour after hour. Um, I love to talk, obviously. <laughs> I'm a big talker. I talk too much. But uh, the idea to talk persuasively, to be a persuader, uh, but not be obnoxious about it either. And, of course, in Hawaii, it's very important, you know, not to be too aggressive. You have to have the You're right touch. Charming. Yeah, and you have to be charming and in a sincere way, but uh, the most important thing is to be really passionate about your position and being very passionate about wanting to help your client. Because I think more than anything else, uh, judges and, and juries, they get it. If you really uh, feel, if you're really very empathetic towards your client and you want them you know, the jury or the judge to understand your client and give your client a fair deal, a good, you know, give him justice, give her justice. But it's, you know, you're constantly learning things. Uh, it's really amazing. I mean, there's always these books that come out, how to persuade, how to persuade a jury, and some of them are helpful, uh, some of them are not helpful. You know, there's a theory now about uh, uh, reptile law. You know, you have to be, uh, you have to appeal to a jury's selfish interests, you know, to get them to go along with your position. Hmm, maybe partly true, but, you know, you can't overdo that. I mean, there's, you know, there's really interesting patterns, but now there's a whole series of books that are written about that. But, um, and then you have to wing it. Sometimes you just have to go on your gut. Yeah, go on your gut. Yeah, you got to freestyle. You got to, you know, follow your intuition. The most important thing. Do you find that uh, juries see lawyers and you know jury trial courtrooms um, through the eyes of people who have watched uh, thousands of them on TV? I mean, are they are they jaded by by what they see on TV, which is maybe accurate, maybe not? Uh, well, they have definitely have preconceived notions of what should go on and what shouldn't. And, you know, you have to tell them that, well, this is a civil trial, that, you know, it's uh, you know, by, by a preponderance of the evidence, not beyond a reasonable doubt. And uh, also, like, they always want to fill in the details. And, of course, the judge won't let them ask questions, but they now can take notes. Oh, they can ask questions now. Some judges uh, have the juries, you know, write out questions. During the trial? Yeah, during the trial. Oh. You know, I mean, it's, it, 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 there's been big changes. But he asks that. the questions for them? Or right, yeah, no. they write, the jury will write out the question and give it to the judge, and if the judge thinks it's a reasonable question, uh, they will, you know, the judge will ask it. I mean, the interesting thing, you know, the great thing about the jury system is having 12 people I mean, you know, you could have like 12 not so smart people, but put those 12 brains together, you have an incredible genius. You know, and that's the wonderful thing. You never, uh, you know, you never know what's going to be important to, uh, to a jury. And that's why sometimes, you know, you do mock juries before the trial, begin before the trial begins. You have a, a, you know, a job agency, uh, you know, a, a hire, you know, hire jurors to come in and, 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 and you put on your case. You get another lawyer to put on the case for the other side. Uh, I did that in one particular case, and there was a, just a very, very important issue that I didn't think about. And when I spoke to the mock jurors after the mock trial, it was, oh, my God, I, for, you know, I forgot to cover that issue. And that, and ultimately, 
it was extremely helpful, and yeah. that's, I think, what won the case when we had the trial. Yeah. You, I mean, it just strikes me that when you stand up there in front of them, you, it's not just that case. It's not just you. It's not just them. It's the whole system, the whole system in this country. Right. It is a statement of patriotism. It is. Happen. It is. And you know, it's, I, I really feel very strongly that our justice system, and particularly the jury system, is, is maybe our last best hope. Because now with presidential elections and congressional elections, you know, effectively in, in a sense being bought, you know, having to, you know, pay more than a million dollars to run for Congress, you know, when I ran for city council, I mean, it was the cost to, for a city council seat is, is several hundred thousand dollars. When you have that kind of money in politics, so only the wealthy can run for office or only someone who's being supported by the very, very, by the billionaires can run for office. And now you have our justice system where it's not that way. It's not that way that, you know, the, it's, it's the side that has the most money wins. You know, you like to preserve that no matter what. It's it's you know. so important. I, I think it's in it's the most pristine um, part of our government so, now. Suppose I tell you that there are people out there who are trying to program a justice system, where you put in all the facts, all the evidence, and it thinks for a few minutes and then it spits out a verdict. Would that work? Computers are stupid. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. You like the Sturm and the Drang. Yeah, of, of the yeah, courtroom and, yeah. and the jury. <laughs> I don't trust computers. I mean, computers don't like me. You know, so I mean, why? You know, I'm I'm telling my computer how stupid it is. My com my computer is telling me how stupid you are. You know, so let's stay Better with, to be personal about it. Yeah, let's stay with human beings. <laughs> well, take all this. You know, you guys married. You create this law firm. You build this law firm. You you know you you do service for the community in so many ways, and then one day. One day, Ray, he gets the idea he wants to run for mayor. So when he tells you this, what do you tell him? I said, life, you know, we finally worked all our life to get to a point where, you know, we're relatively comfortable. Uh, we're not living from paycheck to paycheck. And let's have some fun. You know, let, I mean, doesn't mean we have to stop working to have fun, but know we can go places you know for a week or a long weekend and we can do a lot of things we're more autonomous as our own boss having our own practice I mean of course we're accountable to our clients and to the court but still you know we can uh, still fulfill all the deadlines and fulfill our duty to our clients. So you try to convince them not to do it Yes, I am, because it's, uh, you know, and I've, it's not that I'm, you know, shy of that, because I've done I it myself. I never knew you'd be shy. Because yeah. yeah. I've done it myself. I mean, after I served in CONCON, I ran for State House, and, you know, and I, I didn't make it because I was running against basically two other incumbents. Um, but, you know, I, I thought, this is so non-productive. So I decided, you know, I was going to have a couple of babies and, you know, I wasn't ever going to go back out on the street and wave signs for anybody. But, of course, Richard wanted to run. And, okay, you know. so it became a, a family project. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so how, you know, why did you make that decision? Uh, what, what, to what run did you... for office or, you know, or, or to not run for office again. Uh, no, well, what the is... first one first. Okay, yeah. No, it was just something I always wanted to do I mean I you know it was uh, you know it was, it was just kind of a felt need uh, it was something that I had to do I thought it was a calling I thought I could be successful you have to be you know you have to think positive if you're gonna run for office I thought I had a lot to contribute um, yeah, the more, more I think about it, I should run again. Uh, now, <laughs> Sounds was, that way, actually. Yeah. <laughs> now, it was a felt need. And, but, you know, in a way, um, okay, you know, you have to be philosophical about not winning. But I can take pride that I did make a try. And we need people. I mean, we need uh, good people to run for office. And so I did my, you know, I did a good deed. I put myself out there. Uh, I wasn't the chosen one, but... 
uh, but I did make a contribution to our democratic uh, system of government. So okay, I feel good about that. We're going we're gonna to come back and, 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 and address the second question after this break, which is why didn't you do it again? Okay. <laughs> and why don't you do it again now? You know, still a young man. Uh, Richard Turbin and Ray St. Jew, uh, and uh, they were talking about, uh, we are talking about partners in law, partners in life here on Life in the Law. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs> Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leatham, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon, and on my show I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space, and uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Aloha, Yappers. This is your host, King Zilli, for The Yap Show. Every Friday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, you can catch us here live, Think Tech Hawaii, and then later on, we upload to our YouTube channel. We talk about youth issues, policies, uh, youth programs, and how to transition yourself into adulthood. Right, but this was like a sign, I guess. Hey, life's <laughs> like, hey, right. now's your chance to go back to school, which uh, I'm doing. Catch us here again live, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here with Richard Turbin and Ray St. Chu talking about partners in law and partners in life here on Life in the Law and I Think Tech series. You know, every time I check, I find out you guys did more than I thought you did. <laughs> it's like, do you, you know, do you have time to do all these things? You know, for example, um, you know, Ray, you, uh, you've just been appointed to the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts. I always admired that org organization. It's an important organization. You know, a great state deserves great art. We have to work at that. Exactly. So why did exactly. you put your hat in the ring on that? Oh, well, <clears throat> the, uh, the chair, Barbara ceremini has gone, uh, was a, a longtime professor at the university on uh, art history and uh, various other aspects of the law. And so she asked me to put my name in. I said, well, that sounds like fun. I, I'm a, a fairly visual person, and I, I kind of a, an artist myself. I try to be, uh, although, you know, with the given time I have, I just do it, you know, limit, on a limited basis. But, um, uh, but it is an interesting uh, uh, board or commission. Uh, there's an art in the Capitol on Friday in which, you know, there's a tour of the, the various art pieces around and uh, uh, someone is also speaking about the art um, there. And so it's, um, uh, art is a very important aspect of our, of our society uh, and our civilized society that we have. So... Um, we have to work to preserve it, you know. When I think of performing arts, I think of the uh, symphony is struggling. I think of the opera also struggling, and we have to bring up a generation of kids who will appreciate this. Yep. And uh, that's, I'm, I'm also sure it's a big on, part of what you're doing. Yeah, I'm also on the I own a dance company Same thing. board, and they have very creative artistic dancing and costumes, and you know, it's just incredible what they do. It's so. Covering all the bases, <laughs> and that's wonderful. So, I mean, we're counting on you, actually, Ray. Right. <laughs> we you. need you to save the arts for the state. Well, I'm <laughs> also um, on the um, I'm vice president of the Hawaii State Bar Foundation, in which we're raising money to support public service projects to the public and informing the public about um, the law and lawyers and so forth. And the bar should do that. The bar yes. should have. You know, I mean, there have been people who say that the bar is all within itself and that lawyers are, you know, are great candidates to public service, but they don't do enough of it. Right. Nobody can ever say that about you guys, actually. Thanks. <laughs> so I want to move to international now for a minute. Um, I mean, I, I'm joking when I say, why don't you run for office again? I mean, that will be one of those decisions that that's intuitive. One day you'll wake up and you'll say, Ray, I want to run for office again. And she'll say, of course, Richard. Now go, yeah. now go back to sleep, of course, but now go back to sleep. What's wrong with you, Richard? <laughs> but, uh, you know, in a way, you have. You've, you've joined the East-West Center Board. That's really something. Right, right. This is a very prestigious board, a very important board, and I want to hear all about it. 
It's wonderful. The East-West Center is really, uh, I believe, one of the most important and most wonderful institutions in Hawaii. I mean, it's, a, it's an extremely uh, important institution. I like to put it this way. Um, we don't know how many wars the East-West Center of Hawaii has prevented. Um, you know, it was begun in actually 1959. Uh, it was uh, really started by uh, Lyndon Johnson, who was Senate Majority Leader at the time, and John Burns, uh, you know, our, our, our uh, second governor after we became a state. And uh, Dan Inouye was a tremendous sponsor. Uh, Don't forget George Ariyoshi. Huh? George Ariyoshi also. George Ariyoshi kind of changed, you know, the nature of the institution and its governance, actually. Uh, uh, Governor Ariyoshi helped make the East-West Center uh, truly independent. It was part of the University of, of Hawaii, and then uh, in George uh, Ariyoshi's term as governor, the law was changed to make the East-West Center independent, although it is, it does a lot of work for the U.S. State Department. I mean, a lot of work that the U.S. State Department cannot do. For example, uh, sponsor forums uh, between South Korea and North Korea. Uh, go out to uh, Myanmar when Myanmar was a banned state and bring Myanmar kind of back into the fold of democratic uh, nations. It's, a, it's an educational institute. Uh, uh, it uh, invites um, uh, several hundred uh, students from both Asian countries and around the Pacific and the United States uh, to study. Uh, but it also runs uh, tremendous, very important diplomatic programs. In fact, you know, the kind of the United Nations for the Pacific Island countries operate out of the East-West Center, and the East-West Center runs that. The East-West Center initiated APEC, uh, for example, and now the East-West Center is initiating a worldwide and very important worldwide environmental uh, congress that's going to be held in Honolulu in, in 2016. Very valuable. It, it's an, an incredible organization. I, I recall once I was invited, uh, you know, I, I'm now presently vice chair of the Board of Governors now, and, you know, another story I tell is I was invited to uh, be a, a lecturer for a, uh, a class for the uh, Supreme Court Justices of Indonesia. One weekend, uh, they were invited to the East-West Center uh, for classes on how to institute, you know, the rule of law, you know, democratizing the legal system, not only in, the, in, in Indonesia, but for the 10 ASEAN nations, the 10 nations of Southeast Asia. So I was invited to, um, you know, be a lecturer uh, with several law professors in that area, and it was a Sunday morning. Uh, I mean, the University of Hawaii was, was practically closed, you know, the East-West Center campus you know, maybe we had a couple of janitors, you know, there. There were four different, very important programs going on at the East-West Center that Sunday. You know, a program for Asian leaders, a program, another program for, an, you know, for an environmental group, uh, a congress with, um, you know, military leaders. Well, that really leaders. says something, you know. I, I mean, and that happens it, all the time. It, it, it sounds like the East-West Center is one of those uh, centers of action, center, centers of activity at, at UH Manoa. It it's is. It's really important. It's very, it, it's very important. And, and you know, it, it, you know, it, it, it gets, um, uh, you know, important leaders of uh, Japan and China together, you know, to try to de-escalate the friction they have over the, uh, the islands, the Seikoku Islands. Um, you know, it has conferences between leaders of, of, of North Korea and South so Korea. So as, as the vice, uh, was it the vice chair? Right. Are you actively involved in these, in these meetings? Well, I mean, as many as I want, but, you know, my, my most important job uh, is governance. You know, we have to, uh, you know, hire and, you know, supervise. Uh, the president, uh, who's presently uh, Charles Morrison, create plans for the future. Raise money. Uh, raise money, because now uh, we used to get $30 million from the U.S. government. Now we get $15 million from the U.S. Mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. But our budget is the same because we've raised uh, approximately $15 million a year uh, from private donors and actually from a lot of governments. 
here. Uh, no, oh, no, there, yeah, everywhere, yeah, all you know, in Asia. Uh, we, oh, we have that's remarkable. I know we got a five million dollar grant, for example, from the government of Dubai, um, uh, and the idea is to uh, sponsor English language programs for the ten ASEAN nations uh, to make English uh, the lingua franca, you know, the general language for the ASEAN nations. Uh, we uh, got a million dollars uh, from New Zealand, half a million dollars from Australia for a women's leadership program for, for the Pacific Islands. Uh, we got another million dollars. So this way you can survive. We have to, you, yeah. You can, you can get the money to do the budget and thus survive. You can't afford to get, on, get underwater about these things. No, we, we cannot. No. You know, a lot of the programs are in those countries. Oh, yes. I mean, the East West Center is a bigger deal in Asia than it is in Hawaii. Are you traveling? Are you going to yeah, these, these I places? was. Yeah, we, I was very fortunate. Um, I went to a, a Freedom of the Press conference that was held in Yangon, Myanmar, uh, in March. Uh, the wonderful, uh, you know, wonderful, wonderful conference. So, I hope you guys went together on that. Yeah, one. we did. Yes, yeah, it's it was very, very interesting yeah, how a inspiring. lot of the, the uh, writers and, and press were um, you know, um, arrested and, and oh, you know, it's detained yeah, it's amazing. I mean, for we were writing about certain stuff and they're you know, heroes. how they, how they, the press, yeah. yeah, they're, they're heroes. got through it and, and they're still writing and they're still, you know, I, I, you know, I hope it doesn't happen to the leader of think tech. You know, the, you know these television journalists. Uh, just, just joking. We, you see the First yeah. Amendment over there. Yeah, I know. I know. Thank God we have the First Amendment. But uh, I mean, some of these people were heroic. I mean, we went to, uh, you know, a conference, a dinner there, a dinner conference, and you know, these journalists, uh, TV journalists, uh, print journalists. I mean, being honored, uh, Myanmar journalist who was in prison for ten years. Um, uh, an American uh, woman journalist of uh, uh, Japanese, Iranian, Persian ancestry, and she went over to Iran uh, to do a story, and and she was arrested. You know, she was arrested by you know by a gang of thugs. Uh, Pakistani journalist almost killed by a you know a Pakistani rump group really working for the government. Um, so the East West Center, you know, programs on on journalism and First Amendment. Kind right, of freedom of speech. That's part of so it. So important, yeah. That's and the uh, Jefferson, uh, the Jefferson uh, exactly. journalist organization, or or event every year. That's right. really valuable. Right. So you know what? What strikes me though that um, this is the perfect course for your career, your careers to take. You know, everything we've talked about leads to the internationalization of Hawaii, Hawaii the bridge, right. Hawaii the connection place, Hawaii the place that where people come to to resolve disputes, to learn, to, you know, figure out the rule of law as it applies to them. And you guys are involved in, uh, you're involved in the, um, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the uh, Shanghai, uh, Hawaii yes, Legal um, Exchange Program. Exactly. You've been active in that. We, and we started it. Daiichi I, Bar Association. Yeah, when, when I was uh, elected bar president, my goal, my specific goal was to internationalize Hawaii's law practice. At that time, we had an international committee. Uh, it was moribund. We had two people who were about ready to just close it down. You know, my goal was to get it going. Uh, I initiated the uh, friendship agreement between the Hawaii State Bar Association and the Daiichi Tokyo Bar Association. Uh, we had the, we invited uh, the Mongolian Bar Association over. Uh, we had an international bar convention, the first one, and I was, I'm proud to say by the time I, I left office, we had an international law committee of 30 people. And then Ray, you know, continued, continued that work. Thing. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. when she was bar president by initiating the friendship agreement with the Shanghai Bar So can we hold on to this? I mean, can we consolidate and hold on to these gains? Can we, can Hawaii be... Um, you know, the center of Asia Pacific. Can we be the Switzerland, if you like, of Asia Pacific? Yes. Uh, have we got we, enough traction yes, now? We've got yes. the critical mass, and yeah. there's yeah. a lot we of. We have also a Korean Bar uh, Association affiliation, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Roger Epstein, he's been in China so many times uh, trying to talk 
talk to people, um, getting them involved with Hawaii lawyers and, and um, you know. But you know what I want to see, and I, you probably are in a better place to see it. I want to see our kids go to Asia, mm -hmm. spend some time there, and then come back and bring those lessons home mm -hmm. and help us become that international place. Uh, is that happening? What do we have to do to make that happen? I think it's education is so important. I mean, it has to start in the lower grades. I mean, we really have to, you know, push that with our DOE, you know, Department of Education, and uh, high schools and, you know, universities. We have to, you know, put a lot more emphasis on foreign languages. We have to get our kids to, you know, speak um, other languages besides English. Um, we need more bookstores, and well, that's uh, why your your work is not not yet done. Yeah, yeah. This is the, this never has got to be the the crowning yeah. achievement part yeah. of the career, yeah. the careers together. Yeah. Um, so one more th one more thing, you you know, one more product that you guys have raised. Two two kids, yeah. Yes, and yes. Any yes. of them lawyers? Well, our, our son. <laughs> our son is he's doing the same type of work I'm doing. Uh, he's a plaintiff's personal injury lawyer in in Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. And the other. He's, she's still working on her PhD, <laughs> writing her dissertation. Yeah, yeah, human, well, human geog yeah, human geography. I mean, she's going to make a difference. <laughs> and, you know, she's, her dissertation is the uh, is on the impact of the military on Hawaiian culture on the Waianae perfect, Coast. Perfect. I mean, it's a very, very heady uh, topic. You guys have important. contributed so much to the community, including those kids. And it's really wonderful to have this conversation with you. I hope we can do it again. Very pleasurable, Jay. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Jay. We Thank you, really, Thank you, Ray. really enjoyed ourselves. Richard.